Howdy, howdy. Thanks for clicking on another video of mine. I really do appreciate you. This is going to be another video with a story. I'm going to share one story from Kentucky. And then the last half of the video is going to be an interview with a man from upstate New York. Hope you guys enjoy it. All right, here we go. Here's a story from Kentucky, and here's what the writer says. He wants to stay anonymous. My father and uncle own 53 acres of woods in Kentucky. It is at the end of a one-lane road. We have easement through a large dairy farm, and when we get to the backside of the dairy farm, we have to drop off into a creek and drive about a mile up the creek to our cabin. Our cabin has no power, so we use generators to when we drop off into the creek, it's thick, heavy woods on both sides for miles. Normally, it's just family that goes in this way unless we have friends follow us in to hunt. In 2016, the owners of a large tract of land across the creek from us decided to have it surveyed. Nobody had been on that land for at least 20 years. I have been on this land since I was a kid, before I was even old enough to hunt but I've hunted it for 33 years. I never one time believed that we would have the issues that we are having now. When I was 16, my father spent the night at the cabin. He came home early the next morning and he was cussing. He told us a bear had beat on the outhouse while he was in there. He ran back into the cabin and shut the door. He said he shot through the door with his 300 wind mag because it was beating on the door. I'm now wondering if it was even a bear. In November of 2016, after the surveyors had finished, deer season had just opened. I normally go and stay by myself in the cabin. My cousin's stepson came in and hunted with me for two days. He had been gone for about an hour, and I had grilled some steaks for dinner, and I was watching TV. About 9.30, something hit the side of the cabin several times. It was hard enough to jar the entire cabin. So I grabbed my 300 wind mag and my 45 ACP and a flashlight, and I went outside. The ground was frozen, but I could see turned up leaves where something had moved away from the cabin. I was having to take four to five steps to cover each one of this thing's strides. It went back to the tree line, and it moved around the inside of the trees. As I was tracking it, it circled back towards the creek, and I heard something that sounded heavy landing on the other side of the creek. And then I heard a slight rustling of leaves and branches on the other side. I trailed it back to our side of the creek, and there was not a track one in the creek. It jumped the creek wide enough for us to drive up. This happened several more times that week. I never trailed it back into the woods again that year. I told my family about it, and they just laughed, and they made fun of me. In 2017, I took my friend Bill hunting with me. I sat him down before we left, and I told him what had been happening. He just laughed. Well, I'm telling you right now, he doesn't laugh anymore. Because our second night, I was grilling us steaks outside, brown gravy, mashed potatoes, and green beans. The sun had gone down and we were eating when the banging started on the side of the cabin. The whole house was shaking. Bill stood straight up and his eyes were as big as dinner plates. We grabbed our rifles and flashlights and we ran outside and we saw a set of red eyes about 9 to 10 feet off the ground looking at us from inside the trees. They disappeared and we could hear something large and heavy moving back around the wood line back to the creek. Just like the first time, we heard it hit the ground on the other side and go deep into the woods across from the cabin. We found some tracks of turned up leaves in the frozen ground again, and it was the same four or five of our steps to cover every one of this thing's strides. On January 7th of 2018, I took my six-year-old daughter with me to the cabin. There was snow on the ground and the creek was frozen solid, which made for a smooth ride. The whole scene was beautiful. 
We loaded the deer feeder and we threw out a few ears of corn. Her and I relaxed in the moment and we began to talk. And then I started hearing tree knocks in the woods. After a few minutes, another set of knocks came from about a hundred yards on the other side of the cabin. My daughter looked at me and asked what that knocking noise was, and I calmly told her that I didn't know, but I was not really being honest. I knew what the noise was, and I knew exactly where the sounds were coming from. I know this land like the back of my hand. I reached for my sidearm as reassurance that it was still there. The knocking stopped for about five minutes. They moved further back into the woods and slightly off to the side, and the noises started again. We headed back to the cabin and the knocking would stop and move as we moved around the cabin. I had taken up my rifle by this point and I think these things knew that I was armed. They stayed back and they never came closer. I knew my daughter was a bit concerned, but I remained calm. Soon we were on our way home and my daughter even said that she thought those things stayed away because they knew that I had that rifle. This was my last time with my daughter at the cabin. My seven-year-old baby girl passed away January 2nd of this year from the virus HMPV. That is why this part of the story is special to me. My daughter's name was Mia. I'm worried about what will happen this deer season because I've never heard tree knocks like I did that day with Mia. For the last month, I've been checking my trail cameras and something is piling rocks just out of view of the shutter. Are they marking where they can travel and not be seen by the cameras? Or did the surveyors disturb something to start causing this because it has never happened before? We have used this place for years and this is the first time I remember it being so intense. If anything happens this year, I'm going to keep you posted. And that's the end of his email. And first, I just want to say, I just came up on that party about your daughter. I had read your email about 90% through and the rest of it looked good. And I just started reading it and it actually caught me off guard, buddy. And I'm, I just wanted to tell you, I'm really sorry that you lost your daughter. I have a little girl and I just, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that. And I just, uh, my heart goes out to you. And yes, please keep us posted. It sounds like you have Bigfoot activity on your place. Uh, All I can say is just stay safe, man. You know, there's very few instances where these things really bother people or hurt people, at least from my research. So I, I, I would think that you don't have a whole lot to worry about. My heart goes out to your family for losing your daughter. Oh, it just breaks my heart. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to this interview. I hope you guys enjoy this. I tell you what, before we get into this interview with Brad, let me throw out a few birthdays to people. This will just take a couple of minutes. But before I do, let me say this. If you want me to say happy birthday to one of your children or grandchildren, I need you to email it to me. Um, I'm getting notifications from Facebook and Instagram, and I really don't check those very often. I don't check my Facebook inbox maybe once a week. So I need you to email it to me and I need you to put birthday in the subject line and then in the body, tell me who you'd like me to say happy birthday to or who you'd like to say happy birthday to and I'll make sure and get it in a video. You can send it on Facebook or Instagram, but I can't promise that I'm gonna see it in time. And some of these birthdays are gonna be late. You know, I just, I I don't put out videos often enough and a lot of times I have them ready two weeks before they go out and so it's too late to put birthday wishes in there but i'm backing up and editing this one so i can get caught up on my birthdays okay i'm gonna quit running my mouth here first we have Teresa gorman Teresa's going to be 49 on october the 30th Teresa, your husband james says happy birthday he says that you all got interested in bigfoot when finding bigfoot aired on television and that you guys have followed this channel for a year i really appreciate it and if i remember right this couple is from the uk what a what a nice husband you have Teresa, to think of you like that the next one we have is uh, a happy birthday to daryl hoke i think that's how i pronounce his name h-o-c-h and his son, I don't know what his son's name is, but Douglas was 57 on August the 24th and his son 
turned 24 on August the 20th. Thanks to both of you for watching my videos. I really appreciate you guys and happy birthday to both of you. And we have Patricia Slocum. She wants to say happy birthday to her husband, Sean. His birthday was August the 19th. Sean is an ESRD kidney patient. Sean, I hope your health is good and improving. Patricia's birthday was on August the 12th. Man, she's pretty, I think she loves you, man. I think she wanted to make sure you got that happy birthday. It's a little late, but that's okay. Happy birthday to both of you. Linwood Workman wants to wish his wife, Tammy, happy birthday. Tammy's birthday is coming on September the 5th. That's opening day of dove season in Mississippi, by the way. Linwood is an 18 wheeler over the road driver. He's hauling that freight. He says Tammy catches the videos before he does. They live in North Carolina and Linwood says Tammy is a stay at home Nana with their grandchildren. Isn't that awesome? Tammy, I think Linwood loves you. I think you ought to give him a big bear hug around his neck when he gets home off the road next time. Happy birthday, Tammy. I hope the September the 5th is great for you. At last, Kyle Maynard has two grandsons that he wants to say happy birthday to. His first grandson is Caden Galbraith. I think I pronounced that name correctly. Caden turned four on August the 9th, and his brother Parker turned two on August the 28th. Boys, your grandfather says happy birthday, and he loves you tons. Uh, something about you guys were going to Georgia or something. I'm, I got this one about two weeks ago and just now I'm able to get it in a video. But again, I'll be late on some of these, but still we get them done. We get them done one way or another. And I appreciate you guys doing that. I think this birthday thing is fun. All right, let's move on to the interview. Here we go. Hey, welcome back to another interview. I've got Brad on the line. Brad lives in New York State. I don't know exactly where he lives, but he and I have been emailing back and forth for probably two or three weeks trying to connect on a time. And that's kind of the way it goes with these interviews. Everybody has schedules, and I do, and, and whoever we're talking to does. And uh, so it's <laughs> it gets a little frustrating, but we usually it comes down to this brad and i just said okay we're going to do it right now and so here we are on the phone i'm coming in cold i don't know anything about his story but i know he's got a bigfoot event that he wants to tell us about brad how, how is everything up in new york good good um we're we're, we're kind of getting into the uh you know late into the cool season of our summer so it's uh the weather's nice things are good are, are you uh, in the north part of the state or, I mean, are you, are you close to the big city or where are you at? Uh -huh. No, I am. I, I live in Messina, New York, and I am as about as northern New York State as you can get before crossing into Canada. Okay. So you're up in the, you're up in the Native American. That's where a lot of the, isn't that Mohawk country up there? Yes, it is. Yep. Yep. I, li I live in St. Lawrence County. Um, probably seven miles from the San Regis Mohawk tribe. Wow. That's, that's interesting. They're such an interesting people and they have such a rich history, but you called to talk about Bigfoot. If you want to just start at the beginning, mm -hmm. just go for it. Cause we're, we're all kind of sitting around the campfire here just with, uh, with our eyes bigger than the golf balls. We're ready to hear your story. So just go for it, man. Sure. So, um, so my first encounter takes place uh, October of 1987. Um, I was 10 years old, and it takes place in Cranberry Lake, New York, which is in the Adirondack Park. So it was me and my father, and we were just out for a, for a random drive. It was a beautiful fall day, and we went up to this picnic area up in Cranberry Lake. It was close to the season, but you, you could still go in and walk around, you know, just um, kind of take in the scenery and, you know, and everything and, and enjoy the enjoy the view. So that's what we did. We, we this day, we, we packed a lunch, went up there. We're up there for about three hours. It was probably about, probably about 3.30 p.m. So we were getting ready to leave, and I had to go to the bathroom. So the bathroom facilities were still open, and you had to walk up this, little trail to get to them so so we proceeded to walk up the trail um it was just just him and i in the park in in the picnic area we get up by the building it's a little wooden building um with you know doors to go into the facility and out of nowhere this rock comes flying hits the side of the building 
scared us both to death. And we just kind of both kind of looked at each other. At first, my father just kind of shrugged it off, said, okay. But, he, but he's still looking around because he's like, okay, we're the only two in here. You know, who, who threw the rock? So I went in, used the bathroom. He stayed outside. I came out and another rock comes flying, hits the side of the, the building again. So by now, we're both really on edge. He's like, all right, get behind me. And he kind of pushes me to, you know, around with, it, with his arm. This was the time of year when, like, some of the leaves were just starting to come off the trees. And we had a pretty good, pretty good view, pretty good line of sight into the woods. So we look up the hill and where the rocks came from, we could barely, we could just make out this shape. It, it was a humanoid figure, dark, could not make out, you know, features. But it was swaying back and forth between two trees and between the two trees there was a rock like a pretty large rock it would sway between the trees then it would duck down behind the rock at this point my, my father's getting nervous he's like okay i want you to turn around and walk you know back to the truck slowly he goes and i'm going to be right behind you so as i'm i start walking down the trail we could hear like this uh, vocalization, like a chattering. I became more scared, so I'm walking faster. I get to the truck. I come around, get in the truck, and I'm there about 10 minutes. My father comes down. He gets in, and I can tell he's, he's you know, he's kind of rattled. We drive off. We get down the road, and I go, what was that, Dad? He goes, he goes I don't know. He goes, I think we just might have saw Bigfoot, and I said, I don't know, whatever it was, it was scary. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it was, I mean, and it was a case too where like my father was a, um, you know, was a Vietnam, uh, he was a medic in the Vietnam war. Nothing rattled him. Nothing scared him. And I, I remember the look on his face of just concern and that, that, that concerned me at 10 years old. Yeah. That's a, uh, we've talked about that several times before in some of the stories and actually some other interviews where Matter of fact, the last man I interviewed a few days ago said the same thing. He knew when his dad was worried, it was time to worry. Is yeah, it- and, um, and and I just and, and and I remember like just like getting in like when he, you know, I got in the truck, and I remember when he he came got in the truck, there was just like this this silence, and that just that wasn't my father. You know, like I said, when we got driving down the road, it's finally he's, I'm like, well, you know, what was that? You know, and. But it was a case too where, like, I, I was, you know, I, I, I had become interested in Bigfoot since I, you know, since I was five years old. It was funny because we're like most most parents are reading their kids, you know, stories, you know, bedtime stories. My dad would read to me about Bigfoot, so, you know, that's kind of where my, uh, you know, my interest in the subject came from. And it's just ironic that you know this happened to both of us at the same time. Did you, were you interested in it before this event or after? Did this event kind of spark your interest in it? This really got me more interested in it. It really led me to, you know, say to me, you know, just, just think, okay, you know, maybe there's more out there, you know, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye kind of a thing. Probably when I was about 18, I really started getting into the subject and really researching it, you know, kind of became like, kind of like an enthusiast. You know, I just, um, I would read books, started doing, you know, uh, research um, in libraries, just get, you know, getting to know the subject more. Kind of back when, you know, to talk about it was kind of taboo. I mean, it's more, it's more accepted now, I believe. But back then, you know, if you, I mean, if you told anybody, hey, you know, I believe in Bigfoot, you know, you were really thought of as crazy. <laughs> I, I still get that. I, my buddies are like, hey, hey, go ask him about Bigfoot. Just, just go ask him about it. <laughs> they get the biggest <laughs> kick out of it. So it's still that way a little bit. But so have you, is your father still living? Mm-hmm. Do you guys... No, my uh, my my father passed away in two thousand three, Ken. Okay, so did you guys just? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you lost your dad. Uh, oh, thank you. But did you did you two discuss it more through the years after this first first event? We did, we did, we we talked about it quite a bit. And he was always my my father. He was he was a believer in Bigfoot. You know, that's what he that's what he always thought it was. And the more I thought about, you know, the more I thought about it growing up. You know, remember, you know, more in detail. That's honestly what I believe it was. I, I have no doubt in my mind that's what it was. It, and that's kind of what led me to, you know, like doing, you know, getting into the research aspect of it, you know, doing some investigations, you know, in the Adirondack Park and local areas around here. But that's what sparked it all off. That's what really, you know, fired up my interest in the subject. Right. Do you follow these uh, these guys, the blue line, Bigfoot guys? 
No, no, I don't. Yeah, you need to look up their channel. They're up that way. I'm I'm not sure okay. exactly where they are, but I know they they do a lot of they do expeditions in the Adirondack area, and it's a okay. And they're a funny couple of guys. They're just really nice fellas. And so anyway, you look them up. I I, I don't know Anirod. Every time I hear that word, I think of <clears throat> BLB Blue Line Bigfoot. <laughs> because they're then their videos are good but some of them are kind of comical they just have a good sense of humor so that was your first encounter now how how has your are, have your experiences with this progressed since then in 2013 i actually because because right now because where i live now i'm about 20 25 minutes from the foothills of the adirondacks and then in 2013 um i took a job in saranac lake at a rehab facility. Um, that's, that's what I do for a living. I'm an addictions counselor. I, I took a job in Saranac Lake, um, which is right in the Adirondack Mountains themselves, and I was working a 3 to 11 shift up there. So I would commute um, about an hour and a half to and from work. February of 2014, I was driving home one night. This was about 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. So I'm driving home, and I at the time I was driving a Jeep Wrangler. There was like this clunking noise in the front coming home. So I, I pulled over to the side of the road. It's I'm in the middle. Like I'm right. I'm on Route 30, um, which is right, you know, going through the middle of the, you know, of the Adirondack woods, barely any cell phone service, uh, no houses around. So I get out, I pull over, I get out and I, I grab my flashlight and I'm just kind of checking under the wheel well to, you know, to see what's going on and like see if I had any ice built up or. So when I move around to the front of, of my Jeep, four deer come running out of the wood line and it, it, it scared the hell out of me. And I kind of like fell over onto my, on, you know, onto my side. And I'm like, what the hell is that? So I grab my flashlight and I whip it around and the deer are gone. They, they ran across the road and, and I can't see them at all. So I stand up and I'm kind of like, you know, brushing myself off. I'm like, okay. So as I'm going to get back in my Jeep, I hear these grunts probably within maybe 10 to 15 feet within the wood line. And this is February. So I know it's not a bear behind my Jeep off to the, off to my right, like right, right off the passenger side in the back in the wood line. I hear two more grunts, like whatever it is, the, they're responding to They're, they're communicating to each other. And then I hear like this, like a, I get like a chatter is all is the best way I can describe it. You know, it's almost like two two people talking, and you've probably heard this a lot, you know, two people talking, but you can't make out the conversation. You can't make out words, but you know that it's something's communicating. Right. And, and it scared me. I mean, I, I, I got in my Jeep. I took off, and that, that, that really scared me. But that was, that was my second experience. Now, were you actually – you weren't looking for them. You just happened to be – no, this was completely random. Um, like I said, I, I just pulled over because I heard a noise in the front end of my Jeep, and yeah, all this happened. Wow! And it was yeah, yeah. So it was yeah, it was completely random. All this time you're digging in. When you say research, are you actually going into the woods and looking for them, or are you just reading and and doing some? Oh, I do. I do both. I um I, I get into the woods when I can. I mean, I, I, I'm not hardcore like a lot of people are, but, you know, I, I, I try to get there when I can. Through word of mouth, you know, people have, um, you know, contacted me with, if they've had like an sighting or an encounter. I've collected about 20, right now I'm up to 26 encounters um, that I've collected and documented, you know, from the Adirondacks and a couple even here locally to where I live. People will say, you know, well, hey, you know, get a hold of this guy. He's, you know, he could probably explain what's going on or he can you can come up and take a look. Um, but it, it's like, I, I don't have a website or anything like that. It's just mainly through word of mouth. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. That's why I like, you know, when I, when I watch, when I listen to your channel, you know, I, I love hearing the eyewitness accounts because that just, Oh, I, I enjoy it. It's just, you know, it's, it's just something I love to do. I love to interview people. I love to hear their stories. I love to hear their experience. It's amazing to me. It really is. Yeah. Me too. That, that's kind of why I do this. And, <clears throat> and it's just it's just for the story it's so weird i don't care about i i don't know i just don't feel the need to i've got some some people i'm talking to in alabama right now matter of fact i was over there last weekend and we're going to go back and they have a lot of activity and uh some of the guys i'm going with like uh do you want to camp with us for a couple of nights i'm like 
Hell no. It's 95 <laughs> degrees outside. Why why would I want to do that, you know? And and Right, right. But they're all about it. They want to go, mm -hmm. you know, and they do this all the time. They're out in hammocks and they put themselves out in the middle. Uh, they don't stay in the campgrounds. They bushwhack way out in the woods and they camp and they try to they invite the these creatures to come to them and so anyway, all that to say, I'm not I'm just not into the physical aspect of it i can do it i'm just not that i'd rather be fishing than looking for right Bigfoot. right but i mean um you know i i like i said i'm not you know by no means am i a hardcore you know, investigator but you know I, I do enjoy going out in the woods um and like you know people that have contacted me you know i, I like i've gone up and um you know I've, I've i've investigated you know some some claims and you know stuff like that and i and i enjoy doing it and I mean, like I've never actually worked with a research group, but it's, um, I just, I just enjoy doing it. I've always, I've always loved the subject. And I think, you know, it's, it's finally, you know, it's finally come to a point where I, I think a lot more people are, are believing and accepting the fact that these creatures exist. I mean, I, for one, I, I believe that it's, it's a flesh and blood, you know, animal. I believe that it's a, it's a primate. I, I don't, Personally, I, I don't believe into the, you know, the UFO drop Bigfoot off. I don't believe the cloaking, um, but that's my opinion. You know, that's what I believe. And, and anybody who does believe that, I mean, that's fine. You know, I mean, you yeah. know, everybody, everybody's theory, you know, what they can bring to the table is just, it's fantastic. That's why I am. I, I don't, I'm not critical of anyone's theory because we can all have one. And the reason we can all have one is because the information on these creatures is so, the amount of information is so small that we can actually dream up things and they're all possible in my view they're all possible so but absolutely we, but i kind of tend to stay on the i try to stay on the logical side and based on what we know about animal behavior right now and just kind of follow that line and contrast and compare encounters that i hear to known animal behavior that makes a lot more sense to me than to just say well the reason you couldn't see it was because it cloaked it just vanished <laughs> right, right. Things just don't do that. You know, we have nothing no, to compare no, that no, to. No, no, so. no, Exa exactly, exactly. Well, let me, back to your second encounter, you heard, it's almost like they were talking to each other. Was it, did it sound like a language to you or was it just mainly grunts and things like that? It, to me, Cam, it sounded like, yeah, I mean, I, I I do believe they they have their own language. I, I I believe that, and and that is that is kind of what it sounded like. But it, when I say chatter, you know, it was like, um, yeah, it was almost like they were speaking, almost like words, but nothing that you and I would you know say or do, of course. But definitely, yeah, I, be, I believe they that they were speaking their language. I believe it was two. I believe it was it was two creatures communicating. What they were saying to each other, I have no idea, but I, I did not stick around to find out either. I <laughs> I got oh uh, I got the hell out of there. You know, like I said, I'm in I'm in the middle of the Adirondacks with, with just a flashlight and my headlights on. So I'm like I have no means to defend myself. So I'm like sure. uh, no, I'm not sticking around I'm not sticking around here. Yeah, I don't blame you. Okay, so we you've got the first one with your father, you've got this second one where you hear some chatter, but you didn't have a visual on that second one. No, I didn't. No, there was no visual. What is there any? Have you had other encounters, or is that is that it? Uh, yeah. Um, no, nope, I've had I've, I've had a couple more. Let me see. This would have been probably this was May of 2015. Uh, once again, coming home from work, but this time I was it was in the daytime. Probably about let me see. Probably about I got I got done work early, and I was heading home about six o'clock. And there's a there's a pond called Bardham Pond. Very scenic, very beautiful, you know. So just on the way home, and I'm also a photographer, so I, um, I I stop and take you know random pictures of you know I love nature, love the outdoors. So it was just a beautiful evening. So I pull over on the side of the road and I stop and I I'm just out taking some pictures of the pond. Sun starting to set, so I, I go back and I, I I get in my jeep and I'm just kind of looking through the pictures to see you know what I got, how they look, and maybe 15 feet off to the woods to my right, I hear a tree knock and it's loud and I'm the only one there. I'm the only one around. And just, just out of nowhere, there was just this crisp, loud tree knock, you know, and, and, and I knew what it was, you know, I'm thinking, wow, you know, so I stuck around for a little bit. I didn't hear another one. It was just a single tree knock. So I, I drove off the following day. 
going back up to work, I um, saved myself a little bit of time and I, I stopped there again and I, I went, I, I got out and I went back into the woods a little bit to where I thought I heard it from. And there was, and I did find some, some broken saplings. Um, there were like branches that were broke down off trees. So I said, wow, this is interesting. That's actually a spot that I've gone back a few times to just to check out, monitor activity, you know, see what's going on there. But that was my third experience, just, you know, the tree knock. To me, if, if you're sure what it is, I mean, walking through the woods, you, you just don't hear those kind of things. I suppose I've thought about this a lot, and I suppose that there are occasions where, I don't know, maybe, you know, pines are self-pruning. Mm-hmm. I hear cracks in the woods, not very often, maybe two or three times a year, I'll hear a crack and it's a pine, it's a pine, you know, self pruning a a limb will just break off. And it sounds a lot like something hitting a tree trunk, but it kind of doesn't, you know, it's like, I know that's a limb falling out of a tree. And so, but there's no doubt in your mind that was a tree knock. No, there's no doubt at all in my mind. I mean, it, like I said, it, it was loud. I mean, it was it was almost like a gunshot going off. I okay. mean, it was just that loud and crisp. And I just, like I said, you know, the minute the minute it happened, like the hair on the back of my neck stood up, you know, and it's like, it just that in itself was just telling me, like, okay, you know, something's going on here, you know. <laughs> yeah, you you kind of you knew what you knew what you were hearing, and then your intuition told you there's something going on here. Absolutely. Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah. And and fr- one thing I hear from people all the time is trust your intuition. You know, if you think it's if it's something like that, then trust that instinct and then behave and do the things accordingly that you need to do. So Sure, um, sure. So you've got another one. You've got another encounter, right? I do. This would have been, let me see, June 2016, which would it would have been the next year. And this was my last year working up at Saranac Lake. So, so where I work, you know, people kind of, um, you know, like I said, and they, they, they knew kind of like word of mouth, you know, that I was, you know, into Bigfoot and that I, um, pretty much was, you know, would, like I was kind of like, you know, and, and, and enthralled with them and, you know, would, um, look into it and research. So I had a, um, I had a coworker approach me and she was talking about an experience that she had up at, it was called Moody Pond, um, which is about two miles outside of Saranac Lake. So she was telling me that her and a couple friends, they were camping. It was, it was the previous summer. And she was saying that they went up, set up their equipment, pitched their tent. You know, they were camping, sitting, you know, sitting around the fire. And the first thing I'll ask, like when I do an interview, I'll, I'll ask, okay, you know, were you, were you drinking alcohol? You know, were you, you know, was there any like, you know, drug use? Because, I just want to find out like if at the time, if, you know, if, if their, their state of mind was altered or not, you know, and she said, she said, no, no, there wasn't, there was no alcohol, no drugs. We were just sitting around the campfire. We got a strange feeling of being watched. And these are people that, you know, are, you know, they're from the Adirondacks. They, they camp all the time, you know, very, you know, experienced outdoors people. And she goes, right. She goes right from the minute we set up camp, we just had a feeling we were being watched. So she said they, they stayed up till about, 12 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, they went to bed. They kept the fire going. She said that um, probably about an hour after they'd went to bed, they could hear walking around the tent. And first thing I asked was, you know, well, do you think maybe, you know, was it a deer? Was it a bear? And they go, no, they go, whatever this was, it was on two legs. It was bipedal. So I said, okay. So they, they, they stayed in the tent. And they could, they could hear whatever it was walking, you know, walking around the tent. And finally, I guess had gone away, went, you know, went back to, you know, back into the woods and they came out, they came out of the tent and they were looking around, you know, like, they're kind of like, you know, well, what was that? What was that? And they were talking about how there was this horrible odor lingering in the air. And I, I said, well, can you describe it to me? And they go, yeah, it's, it smelled like, it almost had like a sulfuric, sewage smell to it and i said okay and then one of the um one of the guys that that was with them um actually they found footprints around the tent he took a picture of it and he showed it to me and and just going on the photo you know the picture that he showed to me you know what you know what, what i saw you know definitely looked like it was it was a humanoid foot 
they they measured it at 16 inches long and from what i could see it, it fit you know it fit the typical profile of a, of a big foot footprint you know it had the it had the wide heel you know no arch but you can't tell much from a photo and it was taken at night too so but from what i could tell they were and they were shaken up too she was she was shaken up and she said you know she was telling me that you know she's been camping hundreds of times and that you know she's never been scared in the woods and she said that night she was she was scared she was definitely on edge the following week i said all right i'm going to go up just take a look around and, I, and she she showed me you know on a on a map you know where they set up camp so i went up and i was just looking around and this was probably it was later in the evening, not quite dusk, but it was getting there. So um, I didn't plan on staying long. I just wanted to go up, just kind of get a feel for the area because I wanted to go back, you know, and just kind of take more time to kind of like, you know, check it out and see. So I go up there and I'm looking around, you know, where they had the tent. And there was a couple places I could see tree breaks. They This just stood out to me. So I went up and I was looking at them. What got me was the tree breaks were about nine feet off the ground. So I'm like, okay, this is unusual. And then I'm walking around and I'm, and I'm looking at, and I had an uneasy feeling there. I had a feeling like I was being watched. So I said, all right, maybe there's something to this. So I get done looking around and I'm, I'm ready to head back to my Jeep and I hear a whistle. And I'm like, and, it, and not, not like a bird whistle, not like a, and it was like a, and I'm looking around and, there was nobody else there. There was no other cars there. Um, it was, as far as I know, it was just me. I heard it two more times before I got back into my Jeep and left. Once again, no visual, but you know, I believe that I believe I had a you know a Sasquatch around me. You know, while I was there, and I believe you know the the story that you know my coworker told me. You know, I believe to be you know honest and sincere. You know, she's a, she's a very credible person. Normally, normally when people are avid campers and you don't, you know, if they're up in the woods a lot and then after, <laughs> I don't know how long you knew her, but she probably wasn't known to tell these kind of stories, but she knew you were interested in Bigfoot and she brought this to you. It sounds very believable. And the whistling, Absolutely. The whistling thing sounds this is very typical. That. The, <laughs> I, I, it's unbelievable how many times I hear that, and that is fascinating. You have twenty six. You have twenty six encounters you've collected that you believe are are valid encounters. Are there any of those that you think w would you mind sharing? Maybe a couple with our <clears throat> audience because that's what we love. Oh, absolutely. Let me just think here. What I got? Let me look. I mean, they don't have to be. You know, Bigfoot attacked my dog or any just all of these are so interesting to i know they are to me and i'm sure any anybody listening will love to hear them and it it would be uh, our great pleasure if you would do that sure sure um and, and and the thing is cam is that i've never in in the 26 the 26 um encounters that i've collected not one of them is an aggressive encounter like i like like i have this one where it was actually it's, it's actually um Kind of like a, like a friend of a friend, so to speak. He had a dog. He had a St. Bernard dog. The dog had been struck by a car and was killed, unfortunately. So he buried he buried the dog on his property. This is this is a quick story. He buried it in a. He, he, I'm trying to think. Maybe it wasn't a very deep grave. Maybe maybe two feet um, down. So anyway, so he's telling me he bury he buries the dog and it's it's a fresh grave and. He goes back the next day. The grave is dug up. The dog is gone. In the dirt right beside the grave are two 15-inch humanoid footprints. And talking to him, he's like, I got a feeling what it was, he said. He says, could it have been a hoax? He goes, yeah, maybe. He goes, but. He goes, why would... Nobody, he goes, nobody, nobody else knew that I, that my, my dog had just been hit by a car and that I buried him. He goes, why would people just be like walking around my property, you know, it making, you make, you know, making footprints, you know, and why would they dig up my dog? So he, 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 people he brought, don't do that. People do no, not right, do that. Right, right. Yeah. And he, and he, and he brought that, he brought that story to me that, and he goes, listen, he goes, I, this is going to sound strange. He goes, but man, this is exactly what happened. And I'm like. I'm like, I, I have no idea. You know, I have no doubt. And then this is, and 
and this guy, he's a, he's a college professor, you know, very credible, you know, person, you know, does not make up stories, but, uh, and I'm trying to think, but it's uh, one of the more, one of the more interesting ones. Well, let's back, um, let's back up on that one. I, I've got, okay. so you, you've done some studying on this and I want to kind of pick your brain here. What, why do you <clears throat> think if a Bigfoot actually, okay, first he's got two tracks there in the fresh dirt that was dug up. Whatever it was, had to pull the dirt off the dog, and I'm sure the tracks are sitting there in the dirt. Right. And, and the only thing that would make him think it was Bigfoot is that they were bare, they're barefoot tracks. So, right. number one, nobody's going to be out there barefooted digging up a dog. That, it's just not going to happen. Exactly. But I'm curious what you think about that. Do you think, I mean, do you think they picked, they got the dog out to eat it, or do you think they. Or just uh, why would a Bigfoot? Uh, I, I know, good Lord, why would a human do it? But why would? It, why do you think a Bigfoot would dig up a dog like that? Well, you know, at, at first it really, it really blew my mind, and, and that was my exact question: Why the hell would a Bigfoot dig up a dog? And the only, the only thing I could really come up with is, is for food, maybe. You know, and it's like, I mean, and I, and I've, I've heard different people say, you know, different, you know, researchers, or whatever, say that you know, Bigfoot has this natural hate with dogs. But I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I just can't, but I don't know how they think. So I can't, you know, I say, okay, well, I can't see him a Bigfoot thinking, okay, well, you know, the dog is already deceased. You know, why would he go dig it up? And the only thing I could think of came would be for food. Maybe just a case of like a uh, low hanging fruit for lack of a better term. I've heard the same thing. They hate dogs. And then I've got stories where, I've got one where a woman and she was out on the West coast and I can't remember all the details of the story, but you know, you get to the climax of the story and she looks around and here's this, here's this big hairy creature playing with her dog. Like it loved her dog and it was playing with her dog and she thinks it was a young juvenile maybe, but, uh, and which is one more thing in the quiver that just frustrates me so bad because you get varying accounts of what these things do and it, but that's only one. That's only one compared to the hundreds I've heard that they do not like dogs. They kill them. You know, they'll kill right, them. Right. So. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm so inquisitive. I just love this stuff. And I'm no, no, and, no, that's, that's, that's great. That's and, great. And you, you, you think about, you're a, you think about this thing, these things a lot. And I'm just curious what you thought about that. So, and have you heard any more from him at all? On, on on any activity around his home? Uh, no, I haven't. But I do. Um, I, I, I do keep in touch with him. He's always saying if he, you know, if he, if he has anything else to report, he's going to let me know. So um, I told him to definitely, definitely keep me posted because that that was just a, one of the things where just my curiosity peaked, and I'm like, okay, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's something more to this. Okay, I'm sorry to hold you up on that one. Got you, do you have another one or two you could share with us? Absolutely. So I took a, um, this was a, um, an encounter that I took from, it was a couple of teenagers. This took place in uh, Lake Placid, New York, which is also on um, the Adirondacks. It was two teenagers. They, they lived, they lived on a farm with mom and dad. And they were basically, it, this was like the way, the way they described it to me was that they kept, they kept seeing this, um, this creature coming in and out of their barn. So they told mom and dad about it. I guess like the parents were asking them, okay, what, what is it? What are you, what are you seeing? They told mom and dad, well, it's, it's a bear that walks on two legs. The father was like, okay, you know, can you describe it to me? And what they just, what they described to the father was a, what you, I, I guess a typical, you know, quote unquote, Bigfoot, you know, the, the bipedal, um, you know, long hair all over the body walks, you know, with the, you know, with the, with the slope and the gait. Sure. So the father, he was, at, he, he's actually, um, once again, this was another friend of a friend through, um, where I worked up there, he contacted me and he's like, he's like, I don't necessarily believe in this stuff. He goes, but my kid, he goes, my kids are, 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 are saying this is going on. He goes, I know you're into this. I know you research it. He goes, can, can you just come out and take a look? I'm like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know, come out see what's up. 
so on a Saturday, I you know I, I drove up early before work and kind of went and checked it out. I was talking to his two sons. Uh, one was 16, one was 14. And I was asking them, I'm like, well, you know, how long has this been going on? You know, and they said that it's been going on for, you know, for a couple of years. Their theory was that it was trying to, it, it was trying to get into the horse barn. To do what? I don't know. Come to find out, they would have like um, horse pellets and stuff that they would feed the horse come out missing out of the barn. So my immediate thought was that, okay, you're, you're giving it a food source, you know, and it's, it, it knows that there's food there and it's coming back time and time again to get the food. So the more like over the, over the, probably the course of maybe two months, you know, I was talking with the family I went out a couple more times to, uh, you know, to look around and just investigate, get a feel for it. The father described to me one night that, um, while he, he didn't see anything that he, he, he came across a real foul odor that he was noticing, you know, more often. And he described it as like rotten meat, you know, real, real, real pungent, real, real gamey. Um, I said, okay. You know, I said, that's very common. You know, that's, that's a very typical, he did not want to come out and say that, okay, I, I think I have a Bigfoot coming into, you know, to my barn, you know, the kids were convinced. And they were like, Dad, it's 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 a Bigfoot. <laughs> it's like we we've seen this thing, and he's like, Well, I'm not ready to go there yet. So the um, you know, like I said, I you know I I went out there probably over the course of two months. I I never had a visual encounter, but um, there was one night where it was dusk. There were some vocalizations going on, like some some kind of like some screams and some howls. I did get him to admit that you know there's no. Besides, you know, besides, besides a cougar or a wild, you know, a wildcat, that there's no, there's no animal up there that makes them kind of noises of vocalization. So he, he, he did come that far and he was willing to admit that. And the kids were like, well, dad, that's Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is so fascinating. In your investigation or even with the property owners, did anyone ever consider putting up a trail cam in the barn or around the barn or anything like that? I actually, I, I suggested that they, I don't think they ever did cam because they never, um, they, you know, they never got back to me. They never, you know, said that they did it. And if they did, I'm guessing they didn't get anything on, you know, get any pictures of anything. So, and I think they would have, they would have let me know. Cause I told them, I said, you know, please keep me posted as to what's going on. You know, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to keep track of the activity that you guys got going on out here. Have you heard from them since, or is it, did that just kind of die down? I, I touched base with them probably maybe about a year ago. They and he, he did tell me that they, they they could still hear vocalizations. They did get the um you know the the, the smell around once in a while, um but that's about it. Oh man, that is so interesting. You know there are there there is a school of thought that these creatures like livestock for other reasons and i'm not even going to talk about it i'm never going to talk about it on this show because it's so creepy but that they do you know what i'm talking about yeah i believe i know where you're going (laughs) i I, I don't want to talk about that but it's uh that's one theory that's out there and i don't that again on the logic (laughs) side there is very 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 little evidence of different species crossbreeding with other species i know dogs and coyotes will mate i know that and usually when an animal you know is participating in that activity it's a reproductive drive they right, have and right i know in the moment it is you know it's something that they you know it's it's an animalistic behavior even in humans to a degree but it's it, there's so little ev- evidence of that in nature for me to believe that is just uh, it's so far outside the realm of possibility i just can't especially with a primate with a hoofed animal it just makes no sense at all no sense at i all. agree yeah I, I yeah i agree 100 percent. it just does not make sense all right enough of that let's quit i don't even like to talk about that stuff because it's still <laughs> creepy well, that, that is fascinating. And what I really admire about you is that you're just interested in it. And you say you don't have a a presence on social media with this stuff or it's just kind of word of mouth in your area. People just know you're interested in it and they come to you, right? Yeah, that's all it's been, Cam. 
um, you know, every, you know, um, the, the encounters that I've collected, the interviews I've done, it's all been word of mouth. Um, you know, and it just, it just something, you know, it's, it's just something I love to do. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been interested in it since I was a kid. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the subject. And then, you know, and one of the reasons why, you know, like I love your channel is because, you know, I, like I said before, I love hearing the eyewitness accounts. I love hearing other people's stories because it just, it just continues to validate, you know, that these creatures exist. They're out there. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's just great. You know, I, I, I enjoy it. I'm just, like I said, I'm enthralled with the whole, the whole subject. I really, really enjoy it. And, and, and anybody, anybody that will talk to me about it, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, more than willing to listen and, you know, compare notes, compare stories. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just great. Well, I think we have that in common as you can probably tell mm -hmm. that we could, you and I could probably sit around a campfire and go till late, late in the wee hours telling stories and. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I knew, you know, just, you know, when I, when I started listening to your channel, I, I remember telling my wife, I'm like, you know what? I'm like, this guy is great. I'm like, I could, I could just sit around and we could just drink coffee and talk about Bigfoot, you know? <laughs> yeah. It kind of makes me uh, wish that I wasn't just the only one behind the mic because <clears throat> I, I enjoy interacting with people and, you know, things like this, like we're doing here, I've actually, I actually bought a piece of equipment that's a, I call it my podcast machine. <laughs> it's this really cool little recorder and you can put all kind of microphones on it and set it. We actually went to Alabama and I tried to try to collect some conversations between people around a campfire, but there were a couple of kids <laughs> running around and, you know, <laughs> And the, they they figured out that this mic, it's a kind of a real obvious mic, and they figured out it was there, and they just kind of hovered around it all night. And I didn't get, I got a few things, but I can't, I'm trying to figure out a way to make it complete so that, you know, people that don't, there's a lot of people that are older that listen to my channel, and they love these stories. And I just thought they would be interested in hearing people talking about this thing between themselves and telling stories and it's really fun to do that. And so I hope I get, I can't travel to New York because I have a job kind of like you, you know, I have a job. <laughs> right, right. But I'm hoping to meet people here locally where I can do some of that. There's a couple of people I know and they do campfires. Uh, one guy who just lives, he, he's only about 30 or 40 miles away and he's really into this. He's like you, he's very interested in it. And they have campfires in the middle of the summer. And he's like, come on out. And I'm like, man, I'm not sitting around a campfire in 95 degree weather. I'll come out in the oh, fall. No, I, yeah, I can't, even, I can't even imagine that. Oh. And Brad, it stays hot here until November. It'll, I mean, in October, we'll have 90 degree days. So it's, you, you, up there, you, you're, you, you said yeah, it the, once, you're getting I mean, into we, the cooler months of summer. And I'm, I'm, I'm envious of you. Once in a once in a great while we'll hit you know we might we might hit a stretch up here. like probably um, the first half of July was very hot for us like um, we're we're talking I mean we had we had heat indexes like 103 104 degrees and for us up here that's unheard of so we're we're dying up here when it gets to like that it's just crazy yeah and the weather's changing and I think it's getting warmer and I I don't know that there's anything we can do about that and when I think about Upstate New York, you know, close to Canada. I think about that movie, Last of the Mohicans, with Daniel Day Lewis, and all that. Yeah, yeah. All that beautiful scenery up there, man, and you know those Indian tribes speaking French, and uh, just <clears throat> it's such a rich history in your area, and what a fortunate place uh, for how fortunate you are to live up close to those mountains and. And all that, and I'm—it's—it's it's real impressive. And you're interested in Bigfoot, so that's just—you you and I are friends now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, man. Well, uh, that's great. We're we're about fifty minutes. That's probably that's. I like to keep these around an hour. Do you? You mentioned before that you have theories on these creatures. You think they're flesh and blood, and none of your encounters that you've collected are violent. They're all pretty benign or anecdotal. And through all your studies and listening and reading, et cetera, do you have you do you have any other other thoughts on the creature you'd like to share with the audience? You know, I, I believe that you know 
I believe these creatures are like, in a lot of ways, you know, I believe they're like people, you know, when it comes, you know, to like personality, temperament, you know, I think that each, you know, on an individual basis, I think each one is different. You know, they're, I, I believe they're, they're highly, highly intelligent. You know, I believe that they, you know, they, they experience emotions, you know, like, like we do, you know, I, I really, I really feel that they're, you know, there's a spiritual component to them too, where I, you know, I believe that, you know, I, I consider them kind of like a guardian of the forest, you know, and a lot of the, um, you know, like I've interviewed like a couple of native Americans, you know, from, from, you know, the Mohawk tribe, they believe, you know, and their beliefs are that, you know, they're, they're a spiritual being, you know, they're a guardian of the woods and, you know, they're, they're sacred. Like the Iroquois and the Mohawks, you know, they, they call them the stone giants because of, you know, coming, you know, them coming down from the mountains. Um, they tell of them, in their history and their culture, you know, through the, through the te- the oral teachings. And it's just, uh, you know, so that, that when I, when I, when I talk to these gentlemen, you know, that, that really gave me a whole, like a whole different side of this, you know, like it really like, okay, okay. You know, that's, it really um, opened my eyes, you know, to that, you know, I just, I just believe that they're, you know, they're just, they're, they're a being they're you know, they're, they're definitely an entity and I, they're real. They exist. And they're to be respected. And I just think that they're closer to us than we think they are. You know, it's, it's a case where, you know, I, I think, you know, I told a guy one time, it's like, you know, they're, they're in our own backyards and we don't even realize it. You know, that's what I think. I tend to agree with you. I hate to interject my stories in these interviews, but I'll just make this real brief. My wife is from Bermuda and her mother married her mother is a portuguese woman and she married a man from upstate new york he was stationed in bermuda in the 19 late 40s and through the early 50s and he met her they got married moved back to the united states and i married his daughter and she had three brothers and but he is from upstate new york and his mother was full on a dogga does, does that sound like a familiar tribe up there, Onondaga? Yeah, yeah, Onondaga. Yep. So they'd be. Um, it, um, I don't know how familiar I'm in New York, but yeah, yeah, they they would be located around like the Syracuse area. And I didn't get interested in Bigfoot until uh, years after he passed away. But I would love to have <clears throat> talked to him to find out if his mother ever talked about him. But all that leading up to ask you a question, and I know you probably don't have you know, interactions with the native people, like on a daily basis, and maybe you do, but have you ever run into a native person who thinks Bigfoot is hogwash? Never, never. Several of the friends I have, you know, that are, you know, that are Mohawk, you know, just off the cuff conversation, you know, they, um, yeah, no, they're firm believers in, in Bigfoot and Sasquatch. They're, um, you know, they, they have their own stories, you know, from, you know, around here, like the Algonquins, the Iroquois, and they talk about them, you know, like, like I said, in their teachings and their oral, you know, oral history. And yeah. some are even on like totems. It's a, uh, to them, it's, it's a sacred creature. Yeah. I've never heard of a first nations or native person of any tribe <clears throat> say that Bigfoot is hogwash. Never. I've never heard anyone, of, any, any of them say, oh, that's some of people just making that up, you know? Uh, right. Right. So they're a very, a reliable source on information on these creatures and you you obviously live close to a a wealth of knowledge and folklore about that and and again i'm jealous of you well listen thank you so much for doing this like i told you before we got started this is a favor to me and our audience oh no it, it was it was it was my pleasure cam I, I i've been looking forward to this like i said i i you know i love your show i love your channel um, I'm one of Cam's people, man, and I'm it representing <laughs> Northern New York State. So it was my pleasure. Our people, man, that is so cool. Well, so thank you again, Brad, for your time. Uh, we all, everybody listening, appreciate you, and you are one of our people, and we appreciate you so much. So everybody, thanks for listening, and leave some great comments for Brad. He's a great wealth of knowledge, and we'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you. <laughs>